Hello, and thank you for taking the time to watch this video. We will be covering part one on the various kings of Rome. Today, I am joined by Nicole who will be helping out. After the death of Romulus, the Senate attempted to rule for a short period of time. However, the people wanted to have a king once more. To prevent further tension, an election was held. It is important to note that this position of king was not handed on through birthright. It was an elective post in the People's Assembly. The winner of the election was Numa Pompilius. He was a Sabine. As discussed in the previous video, this meant that he was from outside the city of Rome itself. While Romulus could have been considered a warrior king, Numa was a priest king. He distributed land to each citizen to prevent highway robbery and foster peace. He was very interested in religion. He was advised by a water nymph named Agiria, whom he consulted on religious matters. He made religious practice in Rome laborious, but not costly. Everything religious had to be done perfectly. Any ceremonial business was to be conducted flawlessly. Anything as subtle as a squeak of a rat meant the entire process needed to be repeated. Supposedly, a sacrifice was conducted 30 times until the priest did it correctly. He is credited with the creation of religious temples and the offices in Rome, including the Vestal Virgins and Pontifex Maximus. The latter position acted as the chief priest of Rome. After Numa's death, Tullus Hostilius became king of Rome. As you might garner from his name, Tullus was even more warlike than Romulus. He fought a drawn out war with Alba Longa, the city created by Aeneas' son Ascanius. As Alba was largely under Roman influence, Many consider this to be, in essence, Rome's first civil war. Both sides agreed that whoever lost would agree to unconditional surrender. Collective word entreaties were so important to Romans that they devised elaborate religious rituals simply for treaty making. To prevent unnecessary casualties, both sides agreed to a duel between two sets of triplet brothers, the Horatii for Rome and the Curiatii for Alba. In the first battle, all three Curiatii were wounded and two Horatii died. The last Horatius, named Publius, reversed fortune and killed all three Curiatii, taking advantage of their injuries. They also found themselves separated, further aiding Publius's efforts. As Publius returned, he carried the armor back of the fallen Curiatii. He was greeted by his sister, who was betrothed to one of the Curiatii. She began weeping at the news. Publius was greatly angered. He drew his sword and stabbed his sister in the heart. He shouted, Take your girl's love and give it to your lover in hell. So perish all women who grieve for an enemy. Publius was condemned to death for the murder, but the People's Assembly reprieved him, believing him to be a national hero. However, the Rotius family was obliged to atone for the murder. Once performed, a wooden beam was placed across the roadway under which Publius walked with his head covered as a sign of submission. This artifact survived some time, as it was replaced quite frequently. It was called the Sister's Beam by Roman historian Livy. A tomb was also constructed of hewn stone and stands where Publius' sister was struck down. Hostilities began once again between Rome and Alba. The war eventually ended in Roman victory. The populace of Alba was brought to Rome and granted Roman citizenship, as was common with defeated foes at the time. Alba itself was destroyed. Livy remarked, in a single hour, the work of 400 years lay in utter ruin. It was as if El Belonga had never existed. This would not be the last time that Rome utterly annihilated an enemy civilization due to unrestrained hatred caused by fear. Under Tullus, Rome had established firm control over the population of Elba. Tullus is also believed to have established Rome's senate house, the Curia Hostilia. After Tullus came another king named Ancus Marcius. He replaced ferry crossing on the Tiber with a wooden bridge. Because of a forgotten ritual requirement, the bridge could not be constructed with metal. Because of this, it needed to be replaced by Rome's leading college of priests. They were named the Pontifices, which meant bridge builders. Its reconstruction after floods was literally a religious duty. To prevent the wrath of gods on Romans, religion entered into the process of declaring war. When any casus belli, or cause for war, was committed, a delegation of four men was selected from a college of priests called the Fetiales. The leader of this group was called the Pater Patratus, or Father in Charge. The Pater Patratus 
covered his head with a woolen bonnet and repeated a phrase four times. Once at the border, once to the first person seen across the border, once at the state's city gates, and once more in the marketplace of the state. In the comment section, I have the entire process listed. Ancus Marcius also oversaw Roman expansion by drawing two hills into Roman boundary, the Aventine and the Celian Hills. Ancus also founded a port at Ostia at the mouth of the Tiber which allowed for Rome to develop trade. This brought them closer in contact with the Etruscans, the consequences of which we will discuss in part two of Roman Kings. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please give this video a like and subscribe. Next time, we will be discussing part two of Roman Kings.